Tim Connolly is the manager out at Hume, coach extraordinaire as well. Great to have you back on the show, Tim. Good to be here, BP. It's um, been a massive summer of tennis and also, I don't know if I'm going to steal your thunder, but it's good to have one of our stars, Australian stars, alongside with us as well to sort of talk about it. So don't, don't steal the thunder, Tim. I won't, I won't steal I've got a thunder. page of stats here that I was going to uh, reel off because I've admired this man from afar, but I think we've actually sort of met before or had a, a, a conversation. This is probably uh, well overdue. Uh, Paralympics doubles gold, of course, at Rio. Silver in Tokyo, four-time Australian Open quad doubles champion. He's been number one back in 2019 in doubles. Semi-finals of the Australian Open, the French Wimbledon uh, last year. Uh, of course, awarded the medal of the Order of Australia back in 2017. In 2022, awarded uh, Tennis Australia's most outstanding athlete with a disability. He's a great character and he had a nice January as well. Heath Davidson, it's great to have you on the show. G'day, lads. How are you? It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. When you uh, sort of reflect back, uh, Heath, we're going to sort of cover a, a few topics, but, you know, wheelchair tennis comes into the, the forefront of people's eyes who are the casual sort of tennis observer who are going to a couple of days at the Australian Open or for the diehards are going out to Hume and watching some great action. It, it's a great month uh, for you to really exhibit your sport. Yeah, definitely. I mean, Australian Open's always a huge deal for us, but um, it's uh, really cool and awesome to be down in Craigieburn at Hume to play our two lead-in tournaments, which is which is really cool because you get the uh, best in the world down at one of our local clubs where our juniors and all of just, just the community get around and come and watch. So it's really cool to have a lead-in like that into one of the biggest tournaments of the year for us. So and you, you got awesome. a nice early trophy? I did. It's actually, believe it or not, I've been playing tennis now professionally for eight years and um, yep. that's uh, my first singles title on home soil. So Tim made a big deal about it and gave me this big blow-up number one and stuff. So it was pretty cool, but it's, it was a little bit easier this year without my um, good buddy Dylan playing it. So what, What's that been like, actually? Because, um, I mean, you know, if we're just putting it out there. I know you're good buddies, but, you know, you probably stole a bit of the limelight over the years uh, from your Heath and... Uh, you know, certainly you, you, um, you know, just when you think of, you know, your career and some of those numbers I uh, read out, did you often, did you, did you ever feel in the shadow of uh, Dylan? And now that he's, he's not playing, uh, that maybe more of the accolades have appropriately come for you. And that's no disrespect to Dylan at all. I'm saying this in the. Nah, Dil, Dil's Dil, Dil's a legend. Um, love him to bits, but I was, I was comfortable being in the shadows, mate. It means I could just focus on tennis and doing what I had to do out there on yep. court. And he did all the media and talking because he does a lot better job of that than I do. So, um, no, I was happy to play second fiddle there for a little bit. But now that he's gone, it's um, it's a little bit quieter. And I've had to uh, take take on a bit more of a lead role in, at home in Australia and um, mm. help out with the juniors. And, um, yeah, just happy to, be, happy to be where I am at the moment. I had a really stellar year last year. I'm world number three at the moment. So... Just keep chipping away and hopefully can continue to play good play, uh, play good tennis and inspire the young young fellows and young lasses to um, pick up a tennis racket and get out on court. Yeah, look, BP, I guess one of the, you know, Heath probably had been in the shadows of Dylan, but I can tell you he's right out of them now. And just seeing how he acts at the Hume for those two weeks when we've got the juniors there and, um, you know, we've, we've got... We've got some kids coming through, some juniors coming through. Gene Woodman, who's just been classified as a quad. Yes. And um, he yeah. played his first great story. First quad open singles. And um, we got this great photo of, you know, and, and Heath and Jim, I'm sure, are going to end up playing doubles together at the Olympics or Paralympics one day. Uh, if but, I'm still around. Hey? If I'm still around. He's a bit young, but we'll get there. See oh, how we 35 go. 35 young. I'm getting old and sore, mate. <laughs> yeah, but... You know, look, the role model and, and just the integration with the juniors and the and the elite players and the professionals and, and how they they just embrace all everyone coming through and you know, that whole inspiration aspiration part for the two weeks is is just incredible to see and um and I know the juniors, you know, they obviously get a great buzz, but so do the so do the players. I imagine, and I know we spoke about it, Tim, you know, right throughout uh, January, and we had, you know, plenty of footage uh, from you and your team. Kayla did a great job uh, taking us inside those uh, first couple of weeks. I mean, is that a part, Heath, you enjoy? Is that you're now well established in your career? Is that you can actually sit down with the youth and, and, and tell them that, hey, there is a, there's a real genuine pathway here? Yeah, definitely. I mean, when I was a junior, 
Um, we didn't really have a lot of senior players and stuff reach out and hang out with us and be role models for us. I mean, we had great tennis players and they were always around, but we just didn't really have the interaction that we do nowadays with the young guys. So, and that's a big passion of mine is, um, helping juniors along the way and anything that I can do to help them or give them advice or, um, tell them how my journey was and what to do and what not to do, um, is just something that I really enjoy doing. And, um, I love being out at Craigie Burn because for those two weeks, I do get to do something that I, two things that I love. I get to play tennis mm. against the best in the world and I get to hang out with the young, young men and women that we've got coming up. We've got 14, 14 of the top 50 juniors at the moment. So we, um, we're definitely doing the right things at home and, um, hopefully we can just continue to get more, more people, people into the sport. And Tim, we saw, you know, Tennis Australia actually invest in some of those juniors post the Australian Open, which you can take us inside because we're, we're uh, you know, we know logistically just in tennis in general, we're a long, long way from the epicenter. There are some challenges, where whatever level of tennis, but uh, when you when you invest in your youth, I mean, yeah. things can certainly happen and TA were prepared to do that. Yeah. So three of our juniors, uh, they played the... The first couple of well, the two events at Hume and then um, they took off to Tarbes. So I probably encourage any of the listeners to look up where Tarbes in right. France is. Okay. And it's um, in the French Alps. And so. Pretty ordinary it, spot, it sounds it, like. It'd be a great spot to go skiing. <laughs> I don't know how to play indoor, you know, tennis at that point in time, but it's such a long way. But we took three of our juniors there uh, Ben Wenzel, um, Yassin Hill, and, and Jim Woodman all went across there. And so they were three of the eight players. Um, and just the experience for them to learn to travel, because that's one of the biggest parts for, mm. and I'm sure Heath will talk about this, that yep. the travel part and being able to embrace the travel um, is such an important part of our sport. It is, isn't it, Heath? I mean, you can't get away from traveling, particularly if you're an Aussie. Yeah, well, that's what I was about to say. For us, it's it's a tough gig, but um, I mean, embrace it. You've got to, because if you don't embrace it, then it just becomes a, a chore, really. And um, unfortunately, we do live on the other side of the world, and um, our three-hour flight to get to Brisbane or Perth or wherever we want to go over there, you can go to seven different countries, eight different countries. Yep. And there's just so much easier access to tournaments and good players when you're in Europe or when you're in America, it's only a short flight to Europe from America where is for us, if we want to head over and do a big tour, like I will be later on in the year, I have to set off for three months, three mm. and a half months just mm. to get a good run of tournaments in. Cause it's too hard to fly fly home. And if you drop out early, it's you st like you can't come home where no, a lot of right. guys can over there. So yep. yeah, I've definitely, um, you definitely got to want it. No doubt. It's a tail of the tape with the Aussies. Isn't it? I mean, that, and you can both talk to this, how I suppose the challenges of trying to get the wheelchair community together here in Australia, because we see how strong the Dutch are. Incredible. Uh, the amount of uh, players, men's side, women's side, some juniors coming through, it's a smaller country, but everyone can get together, I imagine, on a more regular basis, whereas we've got uh, Aussies sort of, what, scattered across all different states. How challenging is that, Heath, to get all our wheelchair competitors together? Well, I think we only do it once or twice a year. We have a big um, a big nationwide camp um, twice a year, which gets all of our, all of our athletes together, and um, we do a week camp. But, I mean, I'm really good friends with a lot of the, well, the Dutch um, guys and girls, um, and they... They train together twice a week, every, every week. Um, so. Except for Sam. Sam doesn't go. Sam doesn't go. No, <laughs> Sam, Sam's in his own level. But, um, Sam Schroeder. I mean, he's doing pretty well. He just won the Australian Open. He won two slams last year. He's world number two. And um, I mean, world number one's Neil. So, so, so look, just, just on that BP is that, yeah, Sam is, people might remember, he's the one who took, you know, Dylan to the mm. cleaners last year and yes. spoiled the, the, Australian of the Year party. Yep. Um, Took me to the cleanest too this year at the AO. <laughs> he did, but out at Hume, um, Heath did have him in the semifinals in the second event and it was really tight through all in the third set and Heath um, took the first. And so I think that's something that's really encouraging. I, I've got no doubt. I think, you know, the, the big thing like all Aussies have to get used to is playing on home soil at the AO. And I, mm. I know that brings a, you know, a lot more tension and apprehension amongst the players. And I'm sure Heath, you know, can speak to that, but you know, he's not far away and, you know, and, that, and that's a great result considering, you know, what Sam won his second Australian Open in a row. Yeah, I definitely don't feel like I'm too far away from those boys anymore. Um, I definitely go out there confident and 
that I can play some good tennis and give them a really good run. So I feel like, um, yeah, I'll get them. I'll get them. I'm not too far off, but yeah, just, I don't know. AO this year, Sam just, um, blew me off the court. So props to him. It just, um, yeah, it's it's pretty quick. So at this stage, your uh, career, Heath. I mean, what what are you trying to add? I mean, players have a game, they have a style, but whatever level, they're always trying to evolve or find a, a new shot or just find something they can add, um, you know, to the the shot cabinet, the trick cabinet, if you like. Something that might catch an opponent off guard. I mean, where do you sort of sit and you know try to sort of take another step to uh, get an edge against these? Yeah, very good Dutchmen who are pretty impressive to watch. Yeah, well, I mean, I've been working on the tweener for about a year now and it's not <laughs> doing too well without being in the wheelchair. But now nah, for me, it's just um, these two Dutch uh, Dutch boys are just... You need to do more media. I, I've never heard this one. Yeah, so that's her first one. He's brought that one out tonight just, really um, well. <laughs> they just hit a big ball, like a huge ball for us guys. So we just... We're just working every day about hitting a bigger ball, more consistent, and just a bit more variation in my game style, which can throw them off guard. I think me and Tim had a bit of a chat on the phone the other day, and yep. um, we went over some stats of the Australian Open compared to my match against Sam at Hume and just what I did effectively at Hume, which I didn't do at the Australian Open. And as Tim said, um, like it may not seem very different being at the Australian Open to playing at Hume, but... It's just, yeah, like that's where I train. It's it's like it's a big deal playing at home. And I think I was just a bit of a deer in the headlights this year. I mean, I had a really good run last year and I've gone three sets against Sam the last three times I played him and um, yep. had really, really tight matches. And then, yeah, I just came out and I guess was thinking everything was going to be sort of like it was the last couple of times. And Sam just went bang straight off the mark and I just couldn't catch up. It was over too quick. So, I mean, a lot to learn from that match. And um, I, I came off court and as much as I was disappointed in my performance, um, it was sort of just like, you know what, I'm going to get to play him again. So let's not let it happen again. Let's do what we have to do and yep. figure out what I need to do to stop that from happening again. So Just the, the bigger picture of where the sport's going, uh, Heath. We know that you know the Grand Slam draws are going to uh, continue to expand uh, across the men's and the women's and the quad division as well, which is great, certainly for the sport. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I love to see 16 men, 16 women and um, eight quads at the moment. And I, I do really hope that we can get out to 12 or 16 next year or even later this year with a couple of the other slams. And um, not only that, the US Open last year did juniors mm. uh, wheelies for the first time, which is amazing. Um, young Salim, who yeah. was uh, yeah. oh, I caught up with, the, I think, the Tennis Vic Awards. What a, what a terrific young guy. I had a great yeah. chat to him. Yeah, he was good. Yeah, so he's he was over there and um, did played really well and stuff like that. I think he came second in the doubles. Yep. Um, and, yeah, hopefully, well, I'm pretty sure that uh, the Australian Open next year will have juniors. The um, junior masters have agreed to move dates, so... We can have juniors in all the slams, so that's really cool. And just it's just little things like that move our sport forward, which is what we want. And thanks to the Tennis Australia and Wimbledon and the US Open and Roland Garros for allowing us to be a part of it and just like letting us showcase what we do. Spot on. Yeah. No, look, we we had record entries at Hume this year with the wheelchair, so we're up around 70, which was – um, and this is next year's, we're back to a Paralympic year and mm. the, the growing size of the draw and with the juniors and, um, you know, the increased prize money, which means players are getting so much more professional. I know, you know, say Alfie Hewitt, who won the AO this year, he, um, he came out with two coaches and an entourage with him. So, um, the players are starting to travel a lot more, more like the professional athletes. And he said that he did his first ever real preseason and, you know, his physical, he just, he just won in. Uh, the Netherlands, I think, overnight yeah. again. Yep. Yeah, uh, won Roehampton, I think, mm. back to back, which is cool. Him and uh, Gordon won the doubles as well, and um, Dita just continuing a tear of the women's division. Just yeah. what a record! Two and a half, yeah. two and a half years, I think it's been since she's lost a match. So yep. she's playing really well. Yeah, um, the star. I was watching her and um, Yui Kamiji play. Was it the, I think the Australian Open uh, They're in the final. 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 Yep, they're it in the it final. was quality. And yeah. uh, I've normally got sort of four or five screens going on at the Oz Open. So you're watching all these different matches, but uh, admired the way those two went about it. Because recently, Tim, we've lost one of the biggest names in the sport uh, in, in wheelchair tennis. So in Shingo Kanita, of course, and you talk about Alfie Hewitt coming yep. on. So eras replace eras. We see it across 
uh, tennis, but what a figure he was mm. in the sport. He's, his numbers off the charts. In, in, incredible. And last year when he was out um, at Hume, he actually had one of the Japanese, the Japanese national television making a, a documentary on him. Yep. And there would have been five or six of them filming every every second. So um, I know it's been released in Japan. We, we haven't seen it yet because it probably hasn't been translated. But, you know, that just shows you he is – he is probably Dylan times and a half in, mm. in Japan. He, he is a proper superstar, that yep. man. Like, Incredible. Big, big name. I mean, they've got a cartoon, like a full cartoon in Japan <laughs> of him. It's sick. Yeah. Like, he's a big deal. So. Yeah. And, well, and, and sorry, sorry. And, and, you know, even Alfie Hewitt, like, after we, we, we live streamed the finals out at Hume and um, had contact from the BBC who wanted to um, show the, the finals because of Alfie. And just mm. like when Dylan played last year at the Australian Open, everyone was in there watching and... Um, on court one at Wimbledon, he was he packed it out. He did absolutely, and uh, court one, it's uh, well, it's a sensational court. Uh, where once upon a time, I think what you know, we had a, a podcast with Stephen Huss this week. He won Wimbledon back in two thousand and five. They wouldn't let the doubles on uh, centre court back in two thousand and five. So we've come a, a long way across all the. Uh, divisions of tennis. Right to have the company of Heath Davidson, the current world number three quad wheelchair tennis man, a star for a number of years. I read out his resume at the uh, top of the show. Tim Connolly, the manager of uh, Hume Tennis and Community Centre, which has become, uh, Tim, as we've discussed many times, a real wheelchair hub. I mean, you've got the two big events in January, but you've got other competitions going on throughout the year. And around Australia, give us a bit of a feel around Oz as this sport continues yeah. to develop. Yeah, thanks, BP. It's, look, and and this is something we're really passionate about, and um, we're we're lucky that the state government um, sponsors and contributes to to us being able to hold the Melbourne Wheelchair Tennis Open and the Victorian Wheelchair Tennis Open. And part of that is that going from you know professional through to grassroots. And so every week we have a wheelchair hub, and on average there's somewhere between ten to fifteen players that come. Um, we're now lucky that. Uh, Jin Woodman, who started there, who's now, I think he started there as a six or seven year old. Um, he's now 13. And as we said, he made his debut this year in the, in the quad wheelchair tennis. So, um, and also Slim, he, mm. he's from Hume. He, he plays, he's from actually Roxburgh Park, just yep. down the road. Um, and so he, he's there as well. So, and, and look in every state there is a, there's a hub. So if there's, you know, if you know someone in a wheelchair or if you're in a wheelchair and you want to have a go. Um, this is the time to start playing because it is one of the only para sports where you can actually, Heath, make a good living. Yeah. You're, you're driving a Commodore now, aren't you? Yeah, definitely still driving <laughs> me old beaten up Commodore. I love my car. I actually don't I want a new one, but um, that'll come eventually. But yeah, we um, we are one of the few para sports that has good prize money attached to our tournaments and stuff like that. So we can definitely, it's starting to get, to the point where we can actually make a really good living out of uh, playing tennis, just like the able body guys can. I mean, obviously, it's not quite as good, but it's um, definitely getting better, and that's thanks to um, Tennis Australia, all the sponsors, and just um, just for guys like Tim and stuff for hosting events and mm -hmm. putting live streams up so yep. people can watch to get viewers because we know sponsors comes with viewership. And the more viewers we get, the better the sponsors get. Therefore, we can all benefit from from that so your year typically what does it what does it look like and the challenges around sort of traveling and you talked about going away for you know like a lot of Aussies do you got to go away for a chunk of the year but are you back and forth at other parts obviously the it's the slams and then take us through the other major competitions you're sort of competing in so uh, the, what is it I'm as of now, I think I leave in a week and a half or two weeks to head over to America. Yep. And once I leave Australia, I'm only back in Australia for 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 a month until the end of July. Okay. So, yeah, it's a little bit of time time away from home, um, which which I don't overly like. I like being home, but um, it's I love doing what I do. So it's um it's an honor and a privilege, and I definitely don't take it for granted. Um, I get to travel the world, hit tennis balls and like just, yeah, really experience life. And as I said, I get to do what I love for a living. So it's, um, it's sort of, it's, it's pretty cool. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's really tough for our junior guys, especially like, especially in the wheelies because overseas you've got a lot of junior, a lot of juniors that can just get to tournament after mm. tournament and come home and, stuff like that. But 
for our juniors to go away, you've got like, for example, Jin, who's only 13, who is now in my division for Jin to go away. He's got to take his family because he's yep. only 13 and you can't expect a 13 year old to take a month and a half, two no. months off school to go away and play tournaments just to try and compete against the best in the world. Um, I mean, we are lucky that we've got good heart. We've got a good hub de- down at Craigieburn and there's 15, 16 people there every week playing tennis. So there is definitely different quality of players there and you get different variations of balls and stuff like that. And, um, Jin and all the younger guys that are, um, on a really good path and on the right path are, um, down at Melbourne park with me on a Wednesday night and a Monday. And, um, they get out on court with me and we hit and Jin's, Jin's been hassling me to, uh, team up with him at the nationals for doubles. So you win. I might have to, I might have to do it just to, just to see how my dub, future doubles partner in Brizzy goes. <laughs> Hey, we were sort of talking about the Dutch uh, earlier and, you know, Sam Strader, Neil Schwink and, and others, Didi. So from when you talk to them and when you've been over to that part of the world, what, what is it about the Netherlands that is producing very good wheelchair tennis players? And just a little bit of an insight into their system over there and what can, what can we maybe take out of that to apply here in Australia, if not already? It's got to be the water. It has to be, because I don't know. They just, they just hit with each other. They're like, regardless whether you're a quad or you're in the women's draw, like they're all together hitting balls two, three times a week, which we just don't see here. Like at the moment I'm hitting with Marty and Salim three days a week at Melbourne Park. Are and you done? Yep. 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 And then, um, there he's actually just left tonight. He's mm. at the airport. They're about to head over to the, um, world team cup qualifiers in Thailand. So hopefully they, um, can get a good result over there. But yeah, like we try and hit as a group as much as we can. Um, but it's just, we're so far away from each other. Like obviously we're lucky that in Melbourne, we're sort of all about an hour away from Melbourne park, but it's just so hard for us to hit with Ben Weeks, who's in Sydney yeah. and you've yeah. got um, Ben Wenzel, who's in Cairns, and then you've got guys in Brisbane, you've got guys in Perth and Adelaide. It's mm. just, we're so far apart just to have a regular, a regular session is just tough. So anyway, uh, Tim, around, around that in, in terms of domestically here, <clears throat> trying to pull that together. I mean, there's, there's clearly those logistical challenges of where everyone uh, resides. Uh, What's the discussion sort of behind the scenes? Look, I, I know asking the, the Dutch coaches and, you know, because it's, it's an incredible, you know, the top two men, three of the top four women. Um, and and they, the, geographically, they can get to where they're going to go within two hours. And that's why they get together so often. Now, you know, like we just said, Ben's up in Cairns and or, or Ben Wenzel's in Cairns, Ben yeah. Weeks is in Sydney and then, so, you know, and, and I think this is where we can draw a little bit of concu- conclusion why it's so hard even for, for our able-bodied players that we're, we're just such a massive country and to be able to bring that together that, um, and, but I think it, it also speaks to why we do need some sort of national academy, but at the same time, it's really hard to take a, mm. you know, a junior, like say Jin, who's 13, who you don't want to take away from his family and and you know, and that and that's that's just one of the, the the big challenges. And and I don't think that there's, you know, the answer is probably um, is the answer is probably within our country that it's so big. Yep. Yeah, that's tough. I don't. Know. I mean, unless unless Stocklands for one of the major sponsors uh, <laughs> down at Hume want to uh, uh, rent a couple of houses out for us boys, and we Thanks can have for my, a, have me to mention Stocklands. Yeah. You did that, Heath. I appreciate yeah. that. Have um. <laughs> Yeah. Have have us all come out and um, free right. accommodation for a couple of weeks, mm. and we can play tennis down there together. Well, I mean, one house you good. can just take over Craigie Bird. Now, well, yeah, oh, that's it. Buy every house in Craigie Bird. Yeah, well, everyone there. <laughs> 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 well, look, and, and just quickly, that, and that's one of the, you know, when they when all the when all the players do get together, yeah. and we were lucky enough to have a national camp at it, um, Craigie Bird, in the, a, a couple of weeks before Christmas, and and all getting together and. You know, and the camaraderie between all the players, mm. it, it's it's incredible. And and then you just see that then, it, and I'm sure Heath will agree with me, then it happens globally. Like everyone gets together and it's like catching up with a, you know, a cousin or a sister or a brother that you haven't, you know, seen. And, and the atmosphere, and we, we spoke about this the other day, the atmosphere that a week before the Australian Open, it yep. feels like a real community Absolutely. event, but they're elite players. Um, and then a week later they're at, at the AO and they're competing you know, in front of massive crowds. Mm. 
Yeah, it's crazy. It's so good that we're all together down there and everyone just enjoys it but takes it serious because we are professional athletes and that's what we do. Well said. Hey, one name uh, before we uh, round out. We talked about Elfie Hewitt before, but this uh, this young boy, we talk about the Dutch and how strong they are, but this young boy, uh, Takedo Oda, he's only 16, Heath. He is, now, he I was is. watching him at the corner of my eye on a monitor at – the Australian Open, and boy, oh boy, can he play. Yeah. He, um, wow. I was lucky end. enough to be over in the Netherlands at the Masters at the end of the year and watched him play Alfie in the final, and he got it done in three sets. And for a 16-year-old to beat a guy that is established, former world number one, um, has won grand slams here, there, and everywhere, and just, just have enough, like – confidence and just not panic when it got tight and pull through as a 16 year old is unbelievable. Um, and yeah, Shingo was good and is probably going to be the goat <laughs> of our sport forever, but yep. Takedo may, may chase him wow. down one day. He grabs 16 years of age. He, he, he's amazing BP. Yeah. And there are a couple of shots, but you know, and I think Alfie's getting him at the moment just through physicality. Um, but yeah, Oda's still only 16, and um, I remember seeing Alfie when he was 18. You know, now Alfie's, a, you know, like we said, he's doing pre-seasons, and he's a real physical, he's a fit athlete now. Mm. And He's um, an adult. Yeah, he's an <laughs> adult. <laughs> yep. Exactly right. Yeah, it's incredible. <laughs> hey, guys, thanks for uh, chewing a bit of the fat. Uh, I mean, the wheelchair tennis, I, I, I've really enjoyed it. Uh, the last few years at the Australian Open, was lucky enough to go to – Wimbledon a few years ago, and I watched, I think Gordon Reid was out on uh, court 13. It was 10, 15 deep, uh, just trying to get a vantage point. And uh, the Grand Slam's really getting behind it. Let's hope the draws, as you said, uh, Heath, continue to expand. We find more talent, and we can continue to develop some great talent here in Australia, Tim. So many aspiring young juniors, and hopefully the door can keep opening. Yeah, and look, BP, you know, and thanks so much to the first serve and you for the coverage. You were on the text all the time, semi Semi match point, semi match point. So, mm. but you know, it's just that everyone's starting to jump on board. And um, I know he's got a big TikTok account now that he wants people to follow as right. well. Like he's all over it. Like his social media is <laughs> growing. We love TikTok at the first surf. Give it a plug. <laughs> What's the handle? Uh, my TikTok handle is heath.davidson1, and my Instagram handle is heath.davidson13. Jump on, have a follow if Beautiful. you want. Beautiful. BP, and I'm going to let you go. But he does this amazing um, chin ups in his chair. So if anyone hasn't seen that, you got to see Heath okay. is yeah, chin ups in his chair. Follow Thanks, this man way. on social media. Good luck in your travels this Thanks, year. BP. We'll check in when you're on the road at some Cheers. point.